So um, I'd like to introduce uh, Julia Batley first. Julia, would you mind waving? so that we know who you are. Hello, Julia. Um, so Julia is, um, is a self-employed uh, designer maker and she works under the name Teasel Handmade. And she's been working with leather and Liberty Fabrics to make accessories over the last 10 years and sells her work through shops and galleries as well as uh, craft fairs. And prior to that, she worked in marketing. So she's coming to this discussion from a very kind of commercial and practical point of view. Um, she's got a passion for working with fabric and textiles since she was a child and she's largely um, self-taught. So uh, in our conversations with preliminary conversations with Julia, we had you know, discussions around um, uh, the identity of a maker and how that plays a big part in uh, Julia's kind of craft practice. She also lives uh, in Huddersfield and appreciates the textile heritage of the area, including the, uh, the growing resurgence of small companies and individual makers who are particularly also, you know, rendered visible through the, the Woven Festival, um, who are part of the kind of the textiles heritage in the region. Um, she's interested in thinking about how this might move forward in a, in a kind of a, in an innovative way in the future. Um, and uh, is very interested in hearing about how other people are using textiles in different ways, whether artistically, practically, uh, to celebrate uh, textile heritage, and to, uh, to learn if the labels art and craft are still relevant or useful for the activity that's going on at the moment. So that's Julia, thank you for joining us today. Uh, the next uh, speaker is Nicola Perrin. Nicola, could you wave? Thank you very much. So uh, Nicola Perrin is a maker, craft maker, an artist, and she's also a senior lecturer on uh, the BA Honours Textile course at University of Huddersfield. Nicola weaves cloth, she embroiders, she has an unhealthy collection of seed beads, and she makes quilts as an individual, but also alongside the Meltham Quilting Bee, which is a, a quilting group um, set up by Nicola. She paints and she draws on a weekly basis. Uh, sometimes with her, uh, she makes her own paints and is intrigued by paintings of textiles in particular. She teaches weave, drawing and professional craft and she's here today to talk about what she calls the underdog, the much maligned identity of the amateur. So often considered in the craft or art field as someone who lacks ability and skill, is thought of as inferior to its artisan counterpart and is a creator of bad gifts. So um, she has uh, an affinity with the thoughts of writers such as Stephen Knott, Glenn Adamson and Fiona Hackney, who recognise the amateur as the freest of all makers and the creators of the most innovative, fresh and life affirming outputs. And just to note that Nicola is also currently completing a PhD about the changing identity of the amateur through uh, the communal making of crafts. And she will be talking about some of her research at the Melbourne Quilting Bee. Okay, thank you very much, Nicola, for joining us today. And then lastly, we have Claire Barber. Thank you, Claire, if you can give a wave. Bless you, thank you. So, um, Claire uh, graduated from the Fine Art Department at the Royal College of Art in 1994 and has since exhibited widely, often complete, uh, completing over um, 20 artist, artist in residency projects and commissioning models in the UK and abroad. Uh, recently, she was in the ninth biennial of contemporary textile art at the Museo de Trage in Madrid, in Spain, in 2019. And an installation of her work was presented at the Contextile 18 Contemporary Textile Art Biennial in Portugal in 2018. So Claire's fascinated by the possibilities offered uh, by textiles and she's worked with fabric as a metaphor or, um, or an actual material throughout her career. She uses textiles in a variety of ways, um, particularly around the source of the work and understanding um, that textiles comes from a knowledge of craft skill, um, but using, using that knowledge to inform questions that relate to to site specificity and social engagement. So Claire creates large scale and small scale works, but is interested in the dialogue between space and communities uh, that engage on the work. 
And um, she's also very interested in what the communal aspects of making processes are and how they manifest in and through the work itself. So she'll be talking about some of her work, including blue plaques of intangible experience, spinning wheels, the train track and the basket in the context of her role as a textile artist. So there we go, we've got three very, um, very diverse but potentially overlapping kind of contexts for our discussion today. So, um, Julia, Tom, if you wouldn't mind popping up the images so that uh, maybe Julie can talk us through some of some of her work, that would be really, really interesting. There we go. Here we are, over to you, Julia. Thank you. Um, well, it looks like we're gonna have a really interesting discussion. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I've been a maker, as, as Rowan said, for over 10 years, um, and I'm, I'm largely self-taught. Um, I think the key themes in my work are colour um, and texture, and I work with leather and Liberty fabrics. And I really enjoy the celebrating the, the sort of British heritage um, of, of textiles through the Liberty prints, plus they're absolutely gorgeous fabrics and the colours and the combinations are amazing to work with. Um, and they kind of tell you what they want to go with. You know, it's like going into a sweetie shop, going into my workshop and seeing all the Liberty fabrics there. Um, so working with that and then and putting that together with leather, it gives you this, this lovely textural, colourful, you know, experience and all my things are all the things that I make are very practical they're designed to be used every day um, so I like to think of it as giving sort of everyday pleasure so you might open up the bag that you see in the bottom but it's lined with a, a gorgeous Liberty print um, but you get that lovely feeling of soft leather um, and the smell of the leather it, it's quite um, you know it's quite an experience for all the senses um, which is one of the reasons I really love um, selling directly through through events and fairs because you kind of have to see and feel and touch to, to get an idea of it. Um, I don't know if you want to move on to the next slide, um, Tom. Again, just to show you really, colour um, sort of shouts at, through everything that I do. Um, so just some more examples, glasses, cases, little handbags. Um, yeah. Here we go, a bit more wintry range. We've got the um, the wool scarves, and I've really that's a more recent addition, and I've really enjoyed doing that because using the woven wool fabrics sort of ties it back in again to the the textile heritage of this area. Um, so it's really lovely to, to source fabrics that are woven locally. Um, you know, I bought fabric from the Cone Valley Museum. Um, which has been woven just two minutes from my door, um, and and that's fantastic to work with. Um, so. That gives an idea. I think the other thing to, to say is that Teasel is, uh, as a name, is one that I picked um, to tie into the heritage of, of this area um, because Teasels used to be used to, to card the wool fabrics uh, and there were Teasel auctions locally. So I think it's quite a, quite a local connection that ties into textiles without being too textile-y. <laughs> so uh, that's really where I come from. Um, I'll pass you back to, to Tom. There you go, Nicola, over to you. Okay, so um, hello everybody. <laughs> um, so do you want to move on to the next slide, Tom? So this is um, some images from some work I um, do with the um, wonderful Meltham Quilting Bee. Um, so we um, work together, as you can see there, um, um, on one quilt um, at a time, rather than working on individual quilts. Um, and we've got all age groups involved. Um, and it's just wonderful being able to work um, on one thing together, rather than um, a lot of the time I spend um, making work um, just on my own as an individual. So it's a great experience working with other people. So, uh, so that's Meltham Quilting Bee. Next slide. So yes, so these are two quilts made by the Meltham Quilting Bee. The, um, the one on the left, the turquoise and uh, grey one was one of the first ones that we made when we were first getting together. Um, and then the one on the right is the third one um, that we did. Um, we're sm a slightly smaller group now. Um, what I love about these quilts is uh, the handwriting, the many handwriting of all the different people who are working on them. So when you look at it from the, from the front of the quilts, the stitches are all the same. 
we're quite good at kind of like getting that all matching up but actually um, when you look at the back of the quilts they're completely different and there's lots and lots of different kind of styles of handwriting going on there uh, which I find very exciting um, so next slide so this was one of my quilts um, and this was done um, in response to the Meltham quilting bee and thinking about how we all work in the same space kind of hunched forms, bumping knees, um, leaning over, sharing of um, uh, uh, sewing needles and threads, passing them along. So that was what that one's about. Um, the next two, one, the one on the left is a quilt um, I made, which is, I call a portrait of the Meltham quilting bee. And the one on the right is a painted study of um, a quilt that I've made. Um, I really enjoy painting of textiles so um, so that's that and then I think the final slide yes yeah, so these are my quilts of delusion series so these are all the fantasy quilts that I will make one day <laughs> if I a get the skills and b get the time so um, but yes yeah, so I've got a whole series of paintings of quilts that are kind of fantasy based I don't even know if it's possible to sew them but hey <laughs> I like to dream about these things and that's me Thank you, Nicola. Okay. Thanks. And Claire? Okay, so... Um, okay, so this um, is an image of um, a project that I was doing last year um, with an ex-student of mine, Lee Bowser, um, and a local curator and writer called June Hill. It's called Blue Plaques of Intangible Experiences. And... Um, it uh, was involving some communities uh, that we were working with in Bradford um, and like Nicola's work um, in many ways involved um, engagement um, with people that didn't necessarily um, come with skills in embroidery. Uh, we're really trying to kind of explore in this work um, um, I suppose uh, sort of trying to reverse the perception of the media perception predominantly in Bradford of the way that communities interact, which can sometimes come across quite negatively. So, um, and also some of the acts of enabling us, which don't necessarily really get shouted about. So that was um, one of the main incentives for this, this body of work. So uh, did you want to move on to another slide? Um, so this is quite interesting. <laughs> it's a, a piece of work that actually comes out of Blue Plaques of Intangible Experiences. And it's part of a conceptual radical craft um, initiative set up by Unraveled. And they've done a number of um, quite interesting projects in um, National Trust buildings. And going forward, um, we're looking at working at the London Weapons Centre. Um, because of COVID, um, the work has been postponed, um, but we will be going ahead with the project. And as part of Blue Plaques of Intangible Experiences, um, I've been trying to think about some of the paradoxes of being in nature and conservation, um, particularly um, environment and the relationship between the nature that you go to see, but also the metronome of um, things like aircraft and, and cars and traffic and trying to use embroidery to sort of capture something which isn't visible. I want to involve others in that. And this has been an ongoing practice actually all the way through um, the period of lockdown um, that I've been doing because I haven't been able to work with other people. Um, if you want to go on to maybe the next slide. Um, so uh, I work with really diverse uh, materials. I'm interested in um, craft as a subject as much as a process. So this body of work, I was really interested in um, glove making, the heritage of glove making in Yeovil, um, which had been applied to firefighters' gloves um, and some of those traditional skills and quite an unrecognized skill. I don't think a lot of people necessarily realize how much is made in Britain by hand using very, very traditional methods. And so wanted to really open up an installation or inflatable that would involve 
people in negotiating this heritage in kind of new ways um, that they may sort of relate to and also push their creativity in the way that they might engage with a cutting form which is a basic shape used in glove making. So moving forward, a couple of images um, on the um, left is some work that I was doing last year um, as part of the residency based in Bolton, um, looking at um, creating a contemporary a handkerchief using a lot of digital print and drawing as a commemorative sort of handkerchief um, for the Peterloo uh, massacre. And then the piece of work on the right is a uh, body of work. Actually, uh, Rowan has been involved in this um, and Nicola in different kind of ways, which is um, trying to think about how I might engage with craft practice, both within my own individual career as an artist, but also tucking it away into university curriculums, maybe talking about things in conferences. So it's a body of work about reclaiming sleeping bags for music festivals and offering them to people who may need them. But it has quite a sort of multi-dimensional sort of aspect to it. And then um, maybe the next slide. Um, and this is some work, uh, very large scale work. So the work's about six metres high, working at Hull Paragon train station, filling each window, uh, 13 windows, with digital drawings, prints, and photography um, that is exploring uh, the transmigration phenomena in Hull, which is again a little known history of Hull, where people who were migrate, migrating to the new world would travel through Hull um, on their journey and stay for a few months. And what I was interested in this project was craft that was carried with people as they took their routes to different countries and how they adapted that craft in their new environments. And I like the location of the station because people today are doing the same kind of thing in the way that they move, the, the things they carry, the skills they carry with them, and how they have to be flexible with those skills in, in quite a, uh, I suppose, precarious, precarious climate that we live in today. So I think those are all the slides. Um, Brilliant, thank you, thanks. Fabulous. Okay, so we've got a sense of the uh, three different, extremely different but potentially overlapping bodies of work. So I can certainly see uh, see things to do with. Um, I mean, it was really nice what you were saying, Claire, about the idea of like what happens when you start to think about craft as a subject matter that needs investigation through an art practice or through a set of processes. Really interesting. Also, the kind of the connections between the materials, the, the intimacy or the intimate relationships between materials and acts of making or modes of making, uh, but also the communal aspect to, to craft um, and to textiles. Um, so thank you very much. I, I'm going to throw out the first question, um, which um, and just, you know, if you can raise your hand if you would like to respond but i think the i think just in you know riffing off what i've just said here and, and on your three presentations um how do you define your relationship to art and craft as a practitioner and how might they sit to sit together or do you see them as being separate nicola I can go for this. Thank you. <laughs> I'll dive in. Okay, so uh, so I'm a bit cheeky. I jump in and out of them all. So I don't. I kind of like jump in and out of art, craft, design. I do see them as um, different to each other, um, and I'm quite um, comfortable with that. But I definitely don't kind of like recognise hierarchies in those. I see them as quite flat, and I'm quite interested in the idea of. Um, of um, rhizomatic kind of like thinking where everything's kind of on a level playing field rather than having kind of hierarchies like that but I recognize for, for me and I, and I think that it's different to each um, individual but for me I recognize when I'm working um, as an artist 
it's the kind of like the uh, the concept um the message the narrative that's the primary kind of like driver how that comes about and what form it comes about is kind of relative to what the message is i'm trying to <coughs> however when i'm thinking about craft i think it's the other way around so for me it's about um uh, a process that you really love whether that's canoe building whether it's keeping an allotment whether it's knitting whatever it is I think that's the kind of like the central kind of force for craft and that doesn't mean to say it can't have a message or a narrative in it um, but if it does um, I think it comes out of the making process and the concept of craft rather than the other way around mm. so I think that's my thought but yeah I jump between all of those different kind of uh, fields quite happily to put to suit my needs <laughs> so yeah sorry Brian um I think um for me that's it is quite a, a difficult question and often I feel a million miles away I feel the disciplines are very very distant um very far apart and then at other times, so it depends on what kind of uh, season you might ask me the question, because at other times they feel very, very close and almost in, indistinguishable. Um, and I think for me, um, I always feel I really value the fact that I've been making work over a period of years, because sometimes I'm not aware of that relationship um, between something I've made and craft. And I become aware of it over time. So there's work that I've made which doesn't look like textiles, but then I understand it as textiles. And then there's other works where I've really confronted craft issues, like the uh, work that I did in Hull for transmigration, when I felt that subject of craft was really evident. But it was presented as a um, public art, piece of public art. So I think it's a very private experience of craft which my audience wouldn't necessarily tap into in the same way that I would tap into. So yeah, it, it's, I've also really valued working with curators and the insightful way that a work might be positioned or contextualized. Uh, so it might emphasize links, which I wasn't really aware of. So a couple of years ago, I worked with a, a work around Renaissance mechanics and I am interested in engineering, mechanical engineering, um, alongside other things, but it really emphasized that in terms of how I was positioned alongside printmakers or painters or sculptors who are interested in that subject as well. Um, but I recognize that I saw that through the lens of craft practice in a different way than maybe the other people that I was exhibiting with. So it's, it, it's really, yeah, it's a really interesting question. And I, I do feel like, in a way like Nicola, that they are distinct and they should be distinct. But there's a sort of paradox when sometimes you can't pull them apart as well, you know? So it's not something you can sort of say is black and white, I think, in, for me personally, in a relationship with green art and craft. Although at different times, I will feel incredibly determined about what I feel, but I will change and I'll evolve <laughs> and then I will contradict myself in terms of my th things so it's sort of an evolving relationship i think for me and i i guess that also kind of um maybe like leads into thinking about um when we talk about craft identity as distinct from an artistic identity there are many different well i don't know I, I maybe this is this is my hunch but there are many different kinds of labels for cra craft identities so you could for example um, you know, <clears throat> identifying as a craft practitioner, a designer maker, a maker, you know, a textile designer. I, I, do you, do you feel that, I mean, what do you feel about those multiple identities being visible or in flow in, in the craft world? Is that, is that, um, is that apparent to you? Is that a good thing? Yes, Julia. Yeah. Yeah. I think there are lots and lots of different labels and, um, I think craft can be seen in lots of different ways and I think sometimes it's how you label yourself that matters um, but I think if you if you mention craft I think a lot of people think of, of two extremes really on, on the surface think of a heritage situation so the skills that we mustn't lose uh, you know whether that be 
making coracles or, or I don't know, um, a thatcher or, you know, these heritage craft skills. Um, but on the other hand, you know, the people think of contemporary craft, which can be very high end. And, you know, that's where the, the label between art and the craft becomes blurred. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I personally like to be called a designer maker um, because I think, you know, I design a product and I make it. Um, so whether you call me a crafter, I don't know. I think crafts are, sometimes has negative con connotations. And it's something that Nicola might come in with her view of amateur. You know, this, this idea of amateur craft. Um, I'd be interested to see what, what Nicola has to say about that. But I think the, the perception depends on the audience and, and, and everybody comes with their own preconceptions about what, about what craft is. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Throw it out to somebody else. <laughs> Yes. Yep. Maybe you both keep your moots off. So we, you can sorry, just, sorry. Yeah, it's fine. Um, yeah, I, I, I actually find them very difficult terms. Um, I find all of those terms difficult because um, they suggest to me um, a product and a product orientated approach um, and an individual artist or an individual practitioner. And I'm kind of interested in making, which is broader than that. I'm interested in making work that does not necessarily enter a gallery. I'm interested in work that can be given away. I'm interested in work that can be made by others. I'm interested in work that can be situated in a useful object that you don't necessarily recognize it as such. I'm interested in how art can be useful to others in non-material ways. And so I find those terms really difficult. Um, but I do relate to textile artists because I know more about the history. And so understanding the history and how that has evolved over um, the last kind of 90 years is really useful to me to know. Um, but in their, in their own right, yeah, I find it's a difficult identity to relate to um, because it feels too rooted in the tangible. And I'm kind of interested in the tangible, but I like also the liberty to go outside of that. But I think like many people who are attracted to craft, there is also this sense that the boundary is really useful. So the boundary that you have means that you kick that around and you move it and you decide to leave it and come back to it. So I do also have this kind of strange pull, pull and then, I feel like I need to leave it, come back to it. And it's like, sometimes I feel I'm disloyal and then I feel I'm overly loyal, you know, so there's this pull, pull, to and fro motion, which is, I think, quite interesting because of the tension that that creates in the practice that doesn't sit easily, you know, um, within those terms. So yeah, like that, that, then I would find it awkward to use those time, terms to describe my work. Although if other people describe my work as such, and it means that I can make more work, I will take that term on because I want to make work, you know. But, um, but personally, I find it kind of awkward. Just to flip it, Claire, so that push and pull and that difficult relationship with and not wanting to uh, be contained by any one of those mm -hmm. identities, would you see, say that that is part, an indispensable part of, an art, of what you have to negotiate in an artistic practice? I think that, I mean, I, I, I came through um, a really interesting era when I was doing my MA, because it was the early 90s. And so, you know, the, the canon of art was accepting textiles with open arms. You know, we had Tracy Emin, you know, receive, you know, being presented at the tape for her, and um, all the people I've ever slept with, Ken, you know, and those kind of works meant that, you know, that there was a really real liberty to work in lots of different ways. So it's, it, it's different, I think, if you come from a craft background than if you don't. Um, because you do have that kind of loyalty to the discipline. And it's something that is kind of, you know, the more you work, the more you, you get, you know, you get closer and closer to thinking that you might even be a craftsperson. I wouldn't like to think I'm a craftsperson because I don't practice enough. But sometimes I feel I'm almost getting there. You know, uh, so it's, 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 it's really, yeah, so I think it's different. Whereas I think if you come from an art background, that's not an issue. 
at all mm. for a lot of artists you know craftsmanship i'm happy to get other people to make my work if they make it better than i do and i've gone to companies to get things made for me but sometimes i feel like i really need to make work myself because there is a voice in the way that i or there's something a way that i engage with materials a voice that somebody else can't take on for me and also it's not only that i'm learning about what i'm trying to express in the making process so there, there is this thing with craft which i think is distinctive if you if you have trained in it and you realize your limitations and how you're failing all the time because you're not reaching craft status but at the same time you're trying to express ideas so this kind of tension i'm not sure that fine artists trained as fine artists from how necessarily carry that baggage necessarily in the same way that you do if you're trained in craft mm, thank you thanks claire yeah. i mean so then just nicola i wonder what your whether you can um talk to yeah. this question question about our amateur craft identity in this context yeah. so well, personally, I don't know. I don't think I've thought about it as much as you have, Claire. <laughs> I'm not that bothered, but maybe, I don't know. I think, um, and I've had this conversation with people I work uh, with on quilts, but I wonder if it's kind of my privilege because I, I have been formally trained in textiles and design and fine art and all of these things. And so I'm really lucky. So I'm not worried about being called an amateur. <laughs> it's like it's like yeah that's fabulous i love that idea of kind of like um especially when we think of amateur work as being kind of like free from kind of like the constraints of everything so so i'm really happy with that but i know that it's not necessarily it's always kind of like associated with somebody who doesn't make something very well so um so i i think that people maybe who haven't been formally trained don't like that kind of term and so uh so i recognize that these terms kind of create turmoil i suppose for people but personally i'm kind of quite open to these things i really like the term designer maker and with you julia there i love the fact that you design something and you make something and it's just straight to the point and i guess i think that's why i like the term kind of like um uh amateur really in that it just kind of like i i define it as somebody who's doing something um who is not wanted to make money from it so it doesn't mean that you're not good at making something and in fact there's um, um a government report a massive uh, the community i can't remember what it was called rowan the crafting no a oh, big report that was written a few years ago government report um and it talks actually in there about how quilters amateur quilters are def are the absolute kind of like um the highest in status in terms of quality of making and ideas and forward thinking and i think that applies to hand knitters crochets and a whole range of different people that actually people who are not tied to kind of like making money from something are able to kind of like make something which is much more open to possibilities yes julia interesting as well about saying that uh, it's about it, it, it's about it's, it's not about how you label yourself it's about how other people label you and how that opens up opportunities and so you know i, I come from an amateur background i've self-taught you know i've been saying for a lot of years but i am self-taught um but the, the labels craft and art um, I, as I said at the beginning, I come from a commercial aspect, you know, I, I am a designer maker to make a living. That's, that's where I'm coming from. Um, so it doesn't really matter to me whether you call me an artist or a crafter or a maker. I, I like designer maker. But what it does matter is it, it, it can limit access to opportunities, you yeah. know, in terms of fairs and uh, markets and opportunities. You know, some some people will will consider craft to be will include the kind of work that I do and that's fine. Um, you know, I've been to art markets where I, I can be included in one thing and I can be rejected from another because I'm not art, which I accept. But it, it does have a practical implication on a day to day basis. And so that's really the only reason I'm, I'm bothered about that label from a from a real life, you know, trying to make a living from what I do kind of point of view. Um, yeah. it's, it's not a conceptual thing to me. It's a, it's a practical reality. Absolutely. 
which, which maybe leads on to my next question, which is probably a, a bit of a tricky one. But um, is, is, I think there might be something going on here around value, okay, and the values that are uh, that we attach to to art craft or the art craft relation. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about um, maybe with reference to your to your own experience, but what what are the values that we uh, we are that are maybe kind of attached to textile art and craft making that are kind of visible and obvious, um, you know. So that might have something to you know the commercial value that we might attach to you know uh, pro, uh, things coming out of you know designer maker. Uh, identities but like if we're thinking about all of the different kinds of values that we might need to uh, give to uh, or recognize within textile art and craft which ones are important to you so I'm thinking about especially with the communal aspect the social values aesthetic values you know, community values the values of making <laughs> as, as much as commercial so if we're saying that there are multiple values at work in this kind of in this world like which ones do you give priority to or consider to be important for your for your work and um and the identity of you know art craft i just think um it, it's interesting what julia was julia was saying actually um before about um, opportunities and making a living and there is monetary value and I, um, as well, for many years, needed to make a living out of being an artist. And I'm still, a lot of my works are too expensive to make unless I get funding. Um, so I think that um, the work, the occasions when I have worked on projects which are solely textile art, the first time I did it, I was shocked at how little I was paid in comparison to how much I was paid on fine art projects. And so it, I took the project on because it had such, it had so, it was so flamboyant and in many ways had a lot of incredible elements to it. But I was really irritated by the fact that I wasn't paid the proper wage for that project. And I also think that even though I'm an academic now, it's not good enough to not have monetary value for textile crafts or art. Because if I don't get funding for people that I'm working with on a proper wage, you know, it's, it's not fair. And if I take positions, you know, it, it's not, it's just not good for, for everybody else in a sense. So, you know, I, I, so, so I think that um, this is quite problematic in a way, in terms of how the discipline can grow in a genuine way, or you take on something and you may find that you're actually exhibiting with a range of academics, you know, which can't be a healthy, diverse community because you can't make a living out of doing textile art. But you can as an artist, you know, from my experience, um, because there's just so many more avenues that you can get funding, you know, um, and so much uh, uh, the, the, the um, infrastructure is so much more solid, you know, in terms of the, the, the whole management of, of art practice. Um, so, so, yeah, so I think, I think that's, um, you know, monetary value, but I, I got a sense in you asking the question, you weren't really looking at monetary values, but possibly more about the communal values that we've been discussing or social values, which, um, you know, is a completely different kettle of fish, which actually textiles can create such positive experiences, you know, for people. Um, and there can be so much kindness that you can communicate through textiles and you can, you know, that sort of empathetic kind of quality that you can work with in textiles is really, really fascinating. And I think um, I was really lucky that I was introduced um, in 1992, so it's only been in a year in publication to Susie Gabalik's book, The Reenchantment of Art. And it's taken me like a few decades to figure that book out. But like, I was really lucky to have that at that time because art seemed so kind of product based 
in the early 1990s, you know, when you had things like Sensation, the Royal Academy, such, you know, it's in very monetary value. So it was almost taking the pendulum right over the other side. And to have a book like that, which is really asking some interesting questions about, you know, what, how, how we should, I think it's so timely right now when we're in sort of ecological crisis, when there's so much uncertainty in society, that it's absolutely vital that artists, craftspeople, whatever you do, you sort of engage in that, you know. And so textiles can pull people in because they have this kind of beautifulness about them that is aesthetic, it's visual, uh, has this kind of dimension to it, but it's also sort of, um, it, it, it's not intimidating. So you can kind of pull people in and then you can do sort of interesting things once you have your audience, you know. So I, I think that they're not, I, I, I would like to say that they're important, not just for crafts and art, but they should be important for all visual or performing arts, you know. Um, these these communal values right now, you know, and, and the way that we might find ways to live in meaningful, productive, useful ways, you know, and how we can make a contribution, you know, to society uh, to help 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 out really, you know, and uh, not that we're I don't want to sound like patronising, but I just feel that you know we need to sort of come together and really sort of you know work together to improve society. Julia, yeah, I think that creativity of any kind, whether it's craft or, or art or whatever, has huge value to individuals and communities. You know, it's the, it's, it's the, it's developing skills like critical thinking, problem solving, it's good for your mental health, um, it gives you flow, you get absorbed in it, you forget about what else is happening in the world. So I think there is huge value in making and, and perhaps more so now. I mean, I don't think it's any coincidence that, you know, in COVID that there have been a, a huge resurgence of, you know, online art, competitions people doing it contributing every day or just drawing every day or making or even baking you know people have gone back to to the you know the the skills that uh, that give them satisfaction and, and i don't think it's any mistake um, any coincidence really that a lot of craft comes from domestic sources um and one of the things when i was thinking about this was you know i was thinking about textiles in the past and and how how our perception of things changes over time and I was thinking about um, patchwork you know it's not my field really but um, I'm very aware of the fabrics that came out of America in the 1930s the feed sack fabrics you know it was the Great Depression there was a real sh you know people were poverty stricken there was no money and so the feed sack manufacturers put their feed for the farms in, in floral sacks and the sacks were used by the um, you know, by the farm, farmers' wives to make clothes for the family. And then the scraps of those were used for quilting and the scraps of those were used for rag rugging. Every little thing was used. And that was seen as a, it was very much a practical use. It wasn't considered art, it was a necessity. But when you look back at it through the prism of time and you, people consider these quilts to be artwork and to represent the social, you know, the social times and the use of colour and, you know, individual makers. And, and obviously quilting's developed a long way since, and I'm sure Nicola can talk a lot more about that because it's really not my, it's not my field. But I just think that's interesting that I think sometimes craft has been underrated because it's, it started in a domestic setting mm -hmm. and, and was seen as a woman's craft often I think there is some element of you know of, of that historical hangover and maybe that maybe it's changing I'm sure it is and you know things have moved on an awful long way but it was just just something I thought was was interesting really um, but you know maybe sewing for those farmers wives would have been an escape wouldn't it <laughs> doing something creative um, uh, and and I don't know look and it's also a, a way of expressing your love I think I always think of sewing and making things for other people as being an expression of affection that you are willing to put your time and effort and skills into something to pass on to someone else you know I used to make pajamas for my kids when they're little and I used to say they're not just pajamas I'm wrapping you up in love you know because they were handmade pajamas and I made them for years until they said please stop <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you know there's there's a lot of emotion in textiles uh, Maybe again because of the domestic setting that things started. Um, but anyway, I just thought. Does that, does that feed into what your Nicola? Yeah, your, yeah. Hmm. I mean, it reflects it perfectly, really. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, kind of particularly thinking. So while I 
totally and utterly and in with my professional hat on making money out of it is obviously um absolutely uh, paramount but um uh, I guess I'm here today to talk about kind of like the other side of it, which is where actually where we're not making money from it. And it's, I think it's a rare kind of like, it, it's a rare thing to be able to do something autonomously these days. So we've always got kind of like um, a manager um, kind of like expecting things of us or family members. Every we, There's always things that are expected of us. And often I find that um, engaging in craft um, based activities allow affords us five minutes a week or an hour a month or whatever to be able to actually just do something that's just for the love of it and uh and i think that's really important um uh to kind of uh, have that have that there um without kind of like any worry about whether it's kind of like good enough and uh even if your children decide they don't want the pajamas anymore that's not really the point <laughs> um it's the act of engaging with it and doing it that um for me is um really important um but um what else was i going to say i think um the communal kind of like aspect of making for me um it really um allows me to um to listen and to kind of like engage um with others in a way again that in my working life i don't necessarily um do so well i don't know but um certainly making quilts with other people and go from the design design decisions right at the beginning to the fabric choices to what we're going to do um for our quilt and where it's going to go in the end is is a really kind of like um uh uh wonderful opportunity to kind of like engage in something so open um I mean, when we're, when we're sewing the quilts, you don't even have full control of the, the line that you're making. So I would be sewing along and I would pass my needle on to the next person and they would carry on with that line. So everything in it is, is a very shared experience and it's something we don't really get to do um, so much these days. So for me, that's where they're kind of like, they're very specific values, but those are some of the values that I think are important in craft. That craft particularly brings to our lives. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you all three of you.